Okay, yeah, it looks like everybody's sort of starting to dial in. Um, we'll give it a couple seconds um, just before we start. Sometimes it takes a few moments. Mm. And then actually, I think it would be easiest if we do leave the, I know it's right now, I think it's just me that you guys can uh, see. But then, um, yeah, once I shift over and introduce, then everybody else will be able to see each other. Okay. Okay, well, then I'll just start by introducing myself. Um, briefly, I'm Michael. Um, I work for Finanzwende, which is a German NGO and a think tank trying to uh, change the financial system to make it serve the people. And uh, yeah, together with um, New Economics Foundation and Positive Money EU, um, we have yeah, organized this roundtable, which is um, part of the, the Fiscal Matters EU week of events. And I think it's the fourth event that we're doing uh, today and the last one for today, but there are still several others um, throughout the week. So um, be sure to check them out at uh, fiscalmatters.eu. And um, yeah, without further ado, just to shift a little bit to the, um, to the content, we want to uh, talk about fiscal policy and monetary policy and uh, how they meet and where we're at right now. And uh, yeah, I titled this as a cocktail of uh, fiscal and monetary policy at the lower bound and um, yeah as you might know i mean um, monetary policy has sort of taken the um the initiative after the after the great financial crisis and the euro crisis especially here in europe we've had a large um, monetary policy response and um actually saw that paired with um, with austerity measures and throughout a lot of um, parts of europe and um yeah up until the uh, the COVID um, crisis, up until the, the pandemic started, um, the monetary policy measures that were taken in response to the European uh, to the Euro crisis were never really uh, phased out completely, and so we were still at the lower bound and still in a scenario where with a very active central bank, and um, yeah, then actually faced a, another massive crisis, and at that point we've had now um, monetary policy respond again. In, in Europe and also in the US and in other parts of the world, but also this time had at least a small um, fiscal response with the next gen EU package. And um, yeah, I want to kind of jump into this uh, discussion a little bit and see where and how, uh, where we stand right now, where, uh, what, what role does monetary policy play at the lower bound? How does um, fiscal policy come in? And uh, yeah, just, just to um, make it known why this is relevant right now, we've had a really interesting quote from, um, from Christine Lagarde very recently, um, where she talked about um, yeah, how monetary policy and fiscal policy are currently working hand in hand. And it was quote tweeted by the ECB themselves um, a few weeks ago. So I think that's sort of a, a really timely um, yeah, time for us to just start, uh, start the discussion. And um, I think you might have read this already online, but we're, what we're doing today is we're having two keynotes um, by Professor Moritz Schulalik and by Deputy Governor um, from the Bank of Italia, uh, Alessandra Perazzelli. And then after these two keynotes, we'll shift to uh, the panel discussion. So then I will also introduce um, the panelists for today and um, we'll yeah, jump in there. There'll be some uh, shorter opening statements and then we'll jump into the discussion and also take some questions from the audience and so yeah without further ado i can now um pass along to uh, professor moritz schulalik who is a um, professor in at uh in bonn and also the director of the microfinance lab and also um involved with uh inet and kind of back and forth between germany and the us and has just recently finished a book on um yeah, I don't even know. I, I, for, at the disenchanted state, I did translate it uh, to English, luckily, um, the Entzauberstaat, and it deals with the lessons from the German state uh, that the German state could draw from the pandemic. Um, and then, yeah, after him, um, we'll have Deputy Governor um, Alessandra Perazzelli, who is in charge of the um, supervisory mechanisms and uh, banking um, authority part of, of that in in Italy. So these are the two um, keynotes. And so, yeah, I would ask you, Moritz, to, um, to start now. And then um, after that, we'll have uh, Alessandra come in. And thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very honored and pleased to be on this panel. Um, I should say up front that I'm only speaking for myself and not for any um, other, for any institution. Um, I 
um, I want to make I want to make two points, and um, one will be the first one will be on the overall call it academic um, the evolution of academic thinking about uh, fiscal uh, policy, fiscal stabilization policy uh, in the current at the current juncture. Uh, Michael mentioned the zero lower bound and other challenges, and my second point will be. Um, looking at the European context and what it means. So very, the, the first point is that I think it's fair to say that both academically and in practice, uh, there has been a sea change in how we think about fiscal policy as a stabilization tool. Uh, it used to be following, um, following Friedman's 1968-69 uh, presidential address, the dominant view in the economics profession was that fiscal policy is a bad stabilization tool, that it's too slow, too political, and uh, not very effective, um, and that monetary policy is the stabilization tool of uh, choice. Um, and that view has very much um, reigned supreme for, I would say, a good uh, 30 years or so. Of course, we've built in some automatic stabilizers, but if we think about sort of discretionary uh, responses to uh, shocks, the general overwhelming consensus was that this is a task for monetary policy. Now, two things have changed, and I think both are, both are very, very, um, uh, or three things have changed, and, and all three are very, are very important. The first is the zero lower bound, which restrains monetary policy. Um, it's too, there's not enough time to go into the reasons why we are at the zero lower bound, but I think um, we, to some degree, there's a consensus in the in academia that uh, there are a lot of savings out there that have driven down the natural rate of interest. Um, what, what kind of savings and where they come from is a very interesting question. It might have to do with demography, it might have to do with inequality, it might have to do with uh, the rise of, of emerging markets and, 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 and other in, in economies that have large savings needs, but not the um, assets to the safe assets to save in. Um, uh, be it as it may, we have a within a situation where long-term interest rates have declined quite a lot, and that restrains monetary policy um, uh, more than it used to be. Uh, the second reason why we're like scratching on this this old um, Friedman consensus that fiscal policy is not a good um, uh, stabilization tool is that we have, um, let's say, we have had new models uh, under the name of the so-called uh, heterogeneous agent models that in, in, the, sort of in, the, in the macroeconomic sphere um, now tell us that fiscal policy can be quite, um, quite powerful as a stabilization tool, especially the idea there's always that there's some households that are not all households are the same. And if you take money from some households and give it to households with a high propensity to spend it, this will have quite strong um, um, effects on the business cycle. So it's sort of the latest generation. And this is no longer, uh, you know, there's often this idea that there's kind of Chicago versus the rest. It's no longer that. It's also the people working in Chicago would say that. Um, uh, fiscal multipliers, when monetary policy is constrained uh, and um, the, in the money ends up in the hands of households that uh, have high propensities to consume, that fiscal policy can be very powerful. And the last is an indirect point, which is that we've taken a little bit, we're, trying, we're, we're scratching a little bit the, the idea that monetary policy is, uh, has, has the desirable, um, the, the desirable uh, attribute of being distributionally neutral. Remember in the original framing, it was always said that you know, fiscal policy is always distributional, whereas monetary policy is non-distributional. And again, in the latest models, in the latest um, macroeconomic thinking, that's simply no longer true. Monetary policy also has distributional effects, um, both on the wealth and on the income side. We still don't have a good idea about how large these distributional effects are and how persistent they are. But that, you know, if you think about policies where central banks intervene directly in financial markets to buy certain assets, of course, that is good for the people who own these assets because their prices rise. And it's very much the idea of these policies. Um, and if you happen to be the owner of these assets, that is good for you, at least temporarily. Um, there are also effects on the income distribution that um, might, may be better for the for low income households and where the net effect of these policies are is kind of unclear at the moment. But we have, I think we've evolved in, on all three accounts, 
we are revisiting fiscal policy. And this brings me to my second point, which is the EU is not in a great position to use this tool um, for the reasons that we know, although it has become so much more important also in macroeconomic thinking, the EU for because of its institutional uh, setup and its uh, specific uh, nature is um, you know, not in a position to use this tool very prominently. And I think it has cost us dearly in terms of um, the recovery from the last crisis. And uh, hopefully we're not repeating the same mistakes now that we, um, by being too cautious or slamming on the brakes too fast, uh, we repeat what we uh, did last time, namely in the end, um, a very subpar and costly um, costly recovery. So I think next generation EU is a great step in the right direction. It also puts the burden now on the EU to show that it can deliver. It's the first big step of a coordinated fiscal uh, response uh, coming from the center. And uh, if you think about the political economy debate, which is always caught in between these two lines of how much could the center do um, in terms of insurance versus the moral hazard that um, it might induce to to pool resources, um, you know, the North paying for other countries, which is then used in the political debate in, in various countries. Um, in my reading, it's very important that the Brussels now also shows that this um, sort of insurance at the federal level, if you will, can actually delivers for people, delivers for economies. Um, and um, my last um, remark here is, and, and I don't want to take too much time, is I think the very fundamental question that we all need to think about hard and where uh, I think the answers are not, are not straightforward is um, whether we want to push in a direction where we give more fiscal freedom to the individual member states um, to fight pandemics and recessions and shocks versus building a stronger fiscal center that plays a larger role in ensuring shocks for the EU as a, as a whole and, 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 and the parts that are, that are affected, but at the same time, tightening the national um, freedom to uh, respond. I think that's a very open question whether the right way here is to say, um, we put more fiscal firepower on the federal level, but keep the Kind of balanced budget requirements on the national level. So that would be a federalist way of going sort of in the US direction, large fiscal discretionary power at the center, or what seems to be the course where we're going now in the short term, which might make sense macroeconomically, but could be institutionally different, difficult down the road, that we give more leeway and more freedom to the individual member states to do their own national budget um, policies. Um, again, I think macroeconomically the stabilization function is important and, and we should, uh, we should um, uh, use those, but we might be on a course right now by um, loosening the constraints on the individual member states that actually makes it harder to build that centralized um, fiscal authority in Brussels over time. I want to leave it here. Thank you so much for having me and I look forward to learning from Alessandra. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Moritz. Yeah, and then without further ado, I just pass it on to you, uh, Alessandra. Um, do you want to go next and um, sure. let us hear your thoughts? Sure. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you for for having me here today. Um, I just like to look at the uh, considering the shock that we have lived, you know, through the the COVID nineteen pandemic. I like to look at the medium term and long term perspective from now on. So, you know, if we uh, since this the spring of 2020, you know, we have seen the economic conditions that have uh, improved greatly. And, and today we have hope, you know, for, for with the vaccines, you, you, we have a hope for the future. So, you know, in any case, the damage that has been inflicted uh, to the economy worldwide has not been, you know, restored fully and the crisis is not over yet. Uh, so, and the lags in the vaccination campaign in some countries is also, and the emergence of the virus mutations, you know, are reasons for concern today for the recovery of the global economy. So risks around the path towards the full recovery are not uh, completely, have not completely disappeared. So 
you know, coupled with signs of a uh, of a faster than expected recovery, there's been also much debate in recent months about the risks of a return of high inflation and of fiscal dominance. And I think that both risks should not be uh, overlooked. Um, but I like to point out that um, the current rise in inflation and in the euro area is expected to be uh, uh, you know, quite temporary and uh, probably mainly driven by exceptional factor, you know, the, the strong increase in the oil prices or the timing of the of the reversal of the temporary VAT reduction in Germany, you know, the delayed summer sales in 2020 and, you know, and the cost pressure that comes from uh, from temporary shortages of materials and equipment, just to say a few. Um, if we look at the September ECB staff's macroeconomics projection, there is more persistent price pressures will build on gradually in 2023. Inflation would be probably at around 1.5% and is still well below the new definition of price stability. So I think that in a commodative you know, um, monetary policy, um, you know, I think remains fully consistent with, um, you know, the, the primary objectives right now. So as to high debt, which is, you know, um, you know, an issue that clearly, uh, you know, brings some risks and the recession and the required discretionary fiscal support has caused a large increase in government debts in almost all advanced economies. And in 2020, in the euro area, the government debt to GDP ratio rose uh, by about 14 percentage points to 100 percent, and and a higher debt is obviously uh, you know a, a vulnerable thing, and and this holds especially in countries like mine where the debt to GDP ratio is is particularly high. So once the crisis is over, I think the governments will have um, um, you know with, with a limited fiscal space should gradually adjust their primary. Uh, balances and reduce their debt, also by exploiting the uh, the current favorable uh, differential between the growth of the economy and the average cost of of borrowing. Let me let me look at some long term perspective. You, you know, it, it is very difficult to to foresee how the economic landscape in of the next years will look like. Um, you know, the economy was already in a phase of deep structural changes before the pandemic struck. So some of these changes will likely accelerate as a result of the pandemic and, and of, the, of the policy responses. So this is the case, you know, if we look at the digital transformation of many aspects of the economic activities. You know, the technological innovation in financial services, you know, all that is the, the fintech world will be very, very important and will, I think, bring both new opportunities, new challenges for central banks and uh, and for banks in general, as you know, they, they fintech touches upon many of their activities, you know, from payments to monetary policy, financial stability and, of course, regulation. So. Digital, I think the digitalization will have a you know great impact on other economic activities. You know, we were mentioning the next generation EU. Uh, you know, this is a program that you know aims at you know facilitating this evolution, you know, by allocating the a large share of the resources to measures that will favor the diffusion of a high-speed internet and the digitalization of some public services. With you know, with the final purpose of increasing the overall efficiency of the European economies, um, you know, this crisis has been you know long, deep, is still on, and it's not over. And in you know, all likelihood, some of the um, economic effects will be long-lasting. You know, so but nevertheless, I think in terms of output, you know, the central scenario is one of a recovery in the next months and uh, and years. 
um, according to uh, the latest DCB staff macroeconomic projection, the euro area real GDP should access its pre-crisis value in the fourth quarter of this year and should reach a level com you know, comparable to that expected before the pandemic by the end of 2022. So, you know, yet I think that the, the, the shock, the pandemic shock will leave some important economic legacies, for example, in terms of higher government debt, as I was saying before, and larger central banks balance sheets. But it will create new challenges to the to the policymakers who will face a you know a very tough task of of calibrating you know the proper withdrawal of their support uh, so not to jeopardize their recovery and in and in the case of the euro system the you know the the attainment of of our inflation uh, objective so it will probably influence the way that we we will look at the design of stabilization uh, policies. Um, the ECB has recently uh, released uh, the results of a strategic review, which takes into um, you know, consideration all the lessons of the financial and pandemic crisis and the changes in the economic and social environment in the last two decades. And the governing council announced that it will implement the price stability objectives in terms of an you know, unambiguous and symmetric target to provide a clear, um, you know, anchor for um, expectations on, on inflation. It also made clear that when the economy is uh, operating close to the lower bound on nominal interest rates, you know, forceful or persistent monetary policy action is necessary to avoid, um, you know, negative deviations from, the inflation target becoming entrenched. So I think unconventional measures will, can be, will be continuously used if, if it's necessary. But I think at the same time, the governing councils you know, recognizes that while ensuring that sustainability by stabilizing the economy in larger recessions, fiscal policy also makes its best contribution to price stability. So by contributing to macroeconomic stabilization, you know, there is a counter -cycl cyclical fiscal policy amplifies the effectiveness of monetary policy. You know, from, from the point of view of the Euro area fiscal policy, it's hard to, <coughs> it's hard to underestimate how innovative the reaction of, to the crisis was. You know, the Eurozone um, was indeed particularly tested. And in, in this context, I think the activation of the, you know, SGP's general escape clause allowed national governments to go well beyond the normal operating of the automatic stabilizers to fight uh, handling, you know, to fight the recession. So the SURE scheme, you know, uh, allows for a joint funding of the employment protection policies across the area and the adoption of the, uh, you know, the next generation EU program in, in the summer of last year has contributed immediately to restore some, you know, favorable financial market conditions. And so it will play a crucial role in, um, in the recovery. Um, you know, while, you know, there are many, uh, many of the institutional innovations, you know, implemented during the crisis were meant to be temporary. Uh, I think the current debate now is, you know, is about the review of the fiscal governance framework at the European level. I think it's a good occasion to think, to think carefully how you know about how we are going to manage future crises and whether these measures should be should be temporary and how to use it use them in the in the future i think that in events like these of today i think it's very good to very very important to share our ideas and i think there is a wide consensus on the fact that the european economic architecture has been incomplete for you know a long time and in my opinion the uh, experience of the pandemic you know confirms the need that we have for central fiscal capacity for the euro area and i think that such capacity could be 
you know, a new tool to face shared shocks, you know, together with a common poly a monetary policy, as well, you know, as other asymmetric ones, you know, complementing national measures in the case of reduced room of, of maneuver. And, and Michael, I'll stop here and I'll be here for, for next comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alessandra. That's um, really good. And you already, both you and Moritz both mentioned the, the need for uh, some more uh, fiscal expansion, fiscal authorities, central fiscal authorities. So I'm happy to um, discuss this more with the panel. But just um, before that, really briefly, I'm going to um, let my colleague um, Mark Beckman from Positive Money just give his two cents uh, to the discussion because, um, yeah, they helped organize this event as well. And we would only just give them um, a short uh, spot to, to share their thoughts. Mark. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. Um, as you said, we were happy. We were very happy to host this event with Nansen and the New Economics Foundation. And just want to lay out a bit our motivation that we have in regards to this topic. Um, so, our work at Positive Money Europe in the last years has centered mostly around monetary policy. But of course, we recognize the great importance of fiscal measures and the resulting policy mix, which we are discussing today. And to us, the topic of monetary fiscal interactions is particularly important viewed against the challenges we're currently facing. So we mentioned already the constraint of the zero dollar bound as one of these challenges. Other, other challenges are achieving a full recovery from the pandemic and of course, tackling the climate and ecological crisis to support the EU's goal of climate neutrality. And we think that to meet these challenges, we, we should think about um, the need of fiscal and monetary policy to be coordinated. And this, this requires us to not only think about tools of effective monetary policy coordination that work, and that in many cases history has proven to be effective, but also do to consider what the right institutional framework is to actually meet uh, the outline challenges. And to us, these are key questions, and uh, we're, we're very happy to be part of this event and to have an amazing panel that maybe touches upon parts of these. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, and again, I'll go back to you, Mikey. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, so now we can we can shift um, our discussion over and bring on um, all the all the wonderful panelists that we have um, today. And uh, yeah, I think I'll just kind of, if it makes sense, just introduce you one by one because we will have short opening statements for everyone, so we can kind of do one round. And um, then I think I would like to start then with uh, Anna Maria and then go next to to Dirk then um, Francis and then uh, Philippe um, Lambert at the, at the end. Um, so to just, um, that's alphabetical order, by the way. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, so Ana Maria Zimonazzi is joining us today. She's a professor um, of economics at Sapienza University in Rome and uh, yeah, directs the Master of Economics and uh, also a coordinator in the European PhD program. And our research focuses on macroeconomic social policy, gender, and labor economics. So I'm very interested to hear um, yeah, your thoughts on this question, uh, fiscal monetary coordination at the lower bound. Um, we have uh, yeah, agreed about like five minutes from for each uh, opening statement. And uh, yeah, happy to, to have you start, Anna. Yeah, please. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank for the invitation. In this short time, I would like to raise three issues. The first question is whether we are witnessing a new U-turn in economic theory or whether we are just going through an exceptional event motivating a temporary suspension of the paradigm in place, an issue which has been brought up very shortly by Alessandra Peratelli. The second is what we mean by fiscal policy and the third, what about fiscal rules and the European Monetary Union sustainability? Well, for the first question, the justification for the return of the policy, uh, of the policy mix, refers to the so-called tail events. Uh, in our case, the extraordinary macroeconomic policy support was required to tackle the devastating economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. So if this is an exception, will the return to normal imply the return to the old consensus? That is, is this policy mix only valid in exceptional circumstances? 
for instance, one reason that was given for the return to the policy mix was that uh, when the economy is at the lower bound, fiscal policy is more powerful than monetary policy. Actually, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, uh, monetary and fiscal authorities work against one another, and the responsibility for stabilization fell on the shoulders of monetary policy alone. So one can argue that uh, quantitative easing was necessary because uh, either, as uh, Shularik uh, was mentioning, because of an excess of savings, but uh, when we have an excess of savings over investment, that used to be, according to the Keynesian theory, the role of fiscal policy to enter into action. So we can suggest that uh, there is a role of fiscal policy also when we are above the lower bound, just uh, in order to, to not to reach the lower bound. So uh, this, is, uh, this argument is reinforced by the doubts on the capacity of the interest rate to activate investment in an environment characterized by lack of demand or let's say excess of savings. So this is the first point. The second is what we mean by fiscal policy. Uh, fiscal policy is not simply public spending, but corresponds to a fundamental function of guiding and complementing the market. We are now finally understanding the role of public investments uh, in health, in the environment, in the social field, as well as in guaranteeing the rebalancing of the economic and social conditions between uh, countries and within countries. In short, I think that fiscal policy is best interpreted as industrial and social policy. And in this time, the EU is falling behind uh, in the race for the new technologies as demonstrated, for instance, by the disruption of the supply chains. Uh, and there is an urgent need for common industrial policy. So we don't need helicopter money. I think that governments must abandon the fiction that the central banks create money independent from government. And the government must themselves spend the money created at the behest. Finally, for fiscal rules and debt sustainability, Europe needs rules. The peculiar construction of monetary union and the mutual distrust uh, prevailing between member states exert their price. Mm. However, as uh, these uh, crises have shown, the rules are in no case an answer to problems of technical nature. Instead, they are functional to a project and reflect the internal and internal conditions and international, sorry, conditions for, of the moment and the interests of the leading countries. Therefore, rules change when these projects are rethought following a change in conditions or in the political balance. The Maastricht rules have been pro-cyclical, they have been biased against investment, imposed excessive austerity, especially on debtors, and they've become extremely complex because of mistrust. In the new context, they are wholly out of date. To bring the old stability and growth pact back into effect in 2022, would be a receipt for disaster. It is not only austerity imposed on debt countries that matters. Excessive fiscal tightening in big economies is as much a problem as excess debt. In fact, interdependence between EU economies means that fiscal consolidation in, let's say, Germany will affect the whole union. And on the other hand, we have seen that export-led growth is no longer politically viable in the changed international context. The EU needs a coordinated fiscal policy, one that aims at filling the divide between its members. And uh, in, this in these new con conditions, 
Germany cannot go alone. It needs a strong European community in the new geopolitical context. So what can be done with the, within the treaty? I think that we need a credible commitment to debt sustainability. And this is, uh, I think, unanimously agreed. But uh, determining what level of debt, sustain debt is sustainable is complex and highly uncertain, as it depends as much on national policies as on those other countries and those of the other countries and of the EU, as well as on uh, long-term financial market conditions. So it depends on fiscal and monetary policy. There are various proposals on the table for the debt sustainability, but they all depend in the end on the political will to revisit the current rules. In fact, there are no technical obstacles, as Blanchard suggested with monetary policy, ensuring that the interest rate remains below the rate of growth, the cost of public debt could be substantially smaller than the current consensus estimates. We can afford the larger deficits needed to sustain the recovery and implement the urgently needed industrial policy. But there are clouds gathering on the horizon. It has been mentioned inflation and the specter of inflation may embolden the monetary hoax. And there are debt hoax that are calling for long-term consolidation. So once again, the auspices that are not favorable for an enduring monetary policy mix, in Europe at least. But I hope I will be uh, contravened. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Um, very much on point, and I love how structured every single um, input has been. So, so looking um, forward to to more and uh, yeah, even more uh, emphasis on on uh, yeah the need for fiscal policy at the lower bound, but also uh, credible commitment to debt sustainability. So, with that, actually, perfect transition um, to our next speaker, um, Dirk Enst, who uh, is. Uh, working at the Technical University in Chemnitz um, as assistant chair for the European Economics uh, Department and focuses his research on uh, modern monetary theory. So I'm sure in some way he will touch upon this uh, credible uh, commitment to debt sustainability uh, right now. Yes, thank you. That's, um, that's very nice of you for inviting me. So I'm going to present the MMT perspective with a focus on the Eurozone. And um, I think it fits very well with, with what we've already heard. Um, so we have heard about uh, Friedman, Milton Friedman in the 60s and, nine, and then in the late 60s saying that fiscal policy is not such a good tool. Um, but of course, we're kind of, kind of running out of space here in terms of monetary policy. So the, the big question that is asked here is, does the economy self-stabilize at full employment with price stability and sustainability with respect to resources on its own? And the answer, of course, is no. So we need economic policy, we need monetary policy, we need fiscal policy to, to fix the economy. And the central bank, as we know, uh, sets the interest rates. So there's, there's actually a couple of interest rates. Um, we know that the deposit rate, for example, in the Eurozone is negative. It has been for, for many years. So I don't know what you are talking about when you talk about the zero lower bound. Uh, we are negative. Um, we have seen that interbank market interest rates also in Sweden or Switzerland have been negative for a couple of years, up to almost 1%. And I don't think there's any kind of, of problem to, to make it go to minus 5%. So technically, all of this is perfectly possible. Um, it's not probably something I would like to see, but um, I don't think that this talk of the zero lower bound is, is helpful. So... Um, I think we already heard about the question whether this is a new paradigm here at work or whether we can just assume that this is somehow some kind of exogenous shock and when we can move to normal. So talking about the zero lower bound somehow implies that you can go back to normal. Um, if I ask my students if they know anything but zero interest rates, they, they normally shake their head. Okay, so they are 20 years old and they, they have been following maybe economic policy for, for seven or eight years and it's been more or less zero all the time. So, okay, central banks and they set interest rates, they execute also the payments of the national government. 
and they have some fiscal monetary rules to make sure that when government increases spending, the interbank market stays stable and it also stays stable when tax revenues come in. So that's how, how things are set up usually in the Eurozone, but also with the Bank of England or with other central banks in Europe. Commercial banks then also can create money. They create loans. Uh, mostly this is connected to real estate. And that has been a problem in the last couple of decades because it was um, a lot of speculation involved. It's led to outcomes that are not, not very nice in terms of distribution. Um, and it has also led to widespread corruption, for example, looking at the Spanish real estate markets in the early 2000s. So that's, that's where we stand. So this is what we have in terms of monetary policy. Um, total spending then, of course, private and public spending taken together determines output and then employment, which I think nobody doubts, not even in Chicago, as we've heard. Um, so what is monetary policy then doing? So I think that we have come to an end here. Um, we normally have used this kind of inflation targeting approach. So it, it is kind of supposed to say that if interest rates go down, then private investment will go up. But after almost 10 years of zero interest rates, and also looking at Japan, where they had zero interest rates for, for 20 years, we find that private investment does not go up when interest rates go down. It's the opposite. Okay, so just in, in terms of empirical evidence, we have positive correlation between investment, private investment and interest rates. Okay, this is, we have to find a theory, of course, to, to explain why this is the case, but we had in the early 1980s, we had high inflation rates, high interest rates, and now we have zero interest rates, zero inflation rates, almost uh, last year we had zero inflation rates and negative. Um, I think this is a transitory shock. Um, so I, I don't think that in the inflation targeting approach is successful because the empirical evidence is staring us uh, in the face and it says, no, it's not working. Also, the inflation targeting approach is ugly. So the idea is to stop inflation by creating additional unemployment. How is that? Well, the central bank is supposed to increase the interest rate when inflation uh, is somehow too high. But that means, of course, that private investment will collapse, that there will be unemployed work workers, and then this will lead to, to lower uh, aggregate demand and then less inflation. So that's bad, of course. So those who are unemployed are not actually unemployed, but they're fighting inflation by, by not spending much. Um, but that's a barbarous relict, if you want. Um, that's not the way that we should do monetary policy in the 21st century. So positive interest rates by the central bank also create unearned income for the wealthy. Okay, so if the interest rate is not zero, but positive, then of course, if you have money, you will have more money next, next year. Uh, that's a policy choice. That's nothing that is somehow natural. It's not something which comes out of the equilibrium ideas. Okay, the interest rate can be set by the central bank, and that's going to be it. Okay, so we have had 7% plus unemployment rates in the Eurozone for the last 20 years, which I think is, is way too much. It's not sustainable. First, we had it in Germany, which was kind of successful. Um, so no, no big problems. But then, of course, when the unemployment hits the periphery, um, then we had lots of unemployment where welfare systems are, are non-existent or weak. And that was really a big problem. Also, during the time of inflation targeting, the Queen remarked that no one saw it coming, referring to the global financial crisis. So with this kind of regime, we had a big financial crisis. So we should, we should look at this with a new lens. And I think MMT is, prepare, is providing us with this kind of new lens. So the economy, whether we want it or not, or whether we recognize this or not, it has already changed. And it's driven by government spending. That's what the data is telling us. So government spending crowds in private investment. It's not the other way around. It's not that there's some kind of crowding out. So what we see is that during the boom, tax revenue increases and then leads to a slowdown um, because there's now lower public deficits or even public surpluses. So in 2019, kind of hidden by the corona pandemic, we had a recession in Germany, which was caused by this kind of effect. Okay, economy running hot, more or less. You have surpluses for the government sector, money's taken out of circulation. So of course, if the government uh, gets more in taxes as, as it pays in government spending, then of course you, you take away saving from the private sector. And why is this? Well, it's because unions are so weak. Okay, so inflation rates more or less depend on nominal wage growth, given everything else. And if wages don't grow nominally at two plus percent, then of course, how are inflation rates supposed to grow? So what should we do in this kind of situation? Um, so I think we know that the state is the issue of currency. Um, Christine Lagarde said that last year that it cannot run out of, of euros. It cannot go bankrupt. And um, that means the governments, if supported by the central bank, cannot run out of money. 
We have also seen this now with the pandemic emergency purchase program um, by the uh, ECB, which is supporting the fiscal policies of the member states. And we have also seen this with the stability and growth pact. So it's off now. So the escape clause was activated. And now the Eurozone came out nicely through the crisis. Okay, so these are the rules that have already changed. The economic policy has changed. And I think what we will see in the future is that the ECB's interest rate will stay at zero because there's just no reason to move it up. Government spending will then drive the economy. There's nothing else left. And the political fight will be over the, the, the amount of government spending or indirectly over the size of deficits. 3% is too little. How about 10% or maybe 8 So these will be, will be the political fights of the future, I'm very sure. And um, the ECB will have just have to maintain its, its PEPP program. It has to guarantee liquidity and insolv insolvency to the national governments, because otherwise we go back to Greece in 2014, and that's not what we can afford. So I think that, that with this kind of, of lens, we already live in this kind of new world where interest rates are permanently at zero. Everything safe but a Green New Deal would, will, will not make us move out of this situation. So the discussion should be about how to use fiscal policy in the Eurozone to, to reach full employment and price stability. That's all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dirk. Um, and then, yeah, now I think I would shift again to uh, Francis Coppola, who is, uh, yeah, thankfully with us and worked for 17 years in the financial sector, but then uh, decided to jump out and, uh, yeah, work as a journalist, but also write books and uh, in 2019 published a book, uh, The Case for People's Quantitative Easing. So actually, um, we, we might hear some some thoughts that are similar to, to Dirk's, I'm, I'm assuming right now, and then after that, we'll jump in and, and ask Mr. Lammertz to, to go next. So uh, yeah, Francis, here you go. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you very much um, for, for inviting me. Um, there's a lot that I agree with in what everybody said, and there are a few things that I, points that I want to pick up. Um, as uh, Michael mentioned, I, <laughs> I wrote a book called The Case for People's Quantitative Easing, which was published in 2019, and we then got plunged into a pandemic where we got a chance to prove a lot of what I was saying, um, which was that in a crisis, the job of governments really is to provide the means that people need and businesses need to stay alive, and the job of central banks is to support them to do it. And that is essentially what we've seen in the last 18 months. Um, we've seen um, governments around the world and not just in the Eurozone um, provide extraordinary fiscal support to their economies, um, not in order to stimulate activity, because they were, of course, engaged in shutting down large parts of their economies. But as I said, in order to enable people and businesses to stay alive, and the stay alive thing is really important because if you actually don't provide that support in that kind of shutdown, um, then it's actually very hard, much harder to get out of it again. You know, if 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 people are are you know, starving to death because they haven't got any money, or if your welfare systems have collapsed because too many people are making claims, or if you've got wide redundancies and, and you know, business failures all over the place, it is much harder to emerge from it. So that actually this fiscal support during this crisis has been extraordinarily important and it has been to a considerable extent helped by the explicit backstop provided by central banks um, around the world. And I don't think, and I know that some central banks have been at great, great pains to say, oh no, we weren't really supporting our governments. We were just doing monetary policy and I just go, oh, belay that, who cares? Um, the point was that you worked together to get us through this crisis. And that, I think, does is a game changer. This was an unprecedented crisis. We haven't seen an engineered shutdown like that simultaneously around the world globally ever in history, as far as I know. And so it was appropriate that the response to it was extraordinary. The question now is how much of what was done that done then is extraordinary and how much simply needs to be part of the toolkit. And because of that, I actually want to roll back and go back to the financial crisis, because that was a much more typical recession in many ways. And we made some catastrophic policy errors, not immediately, 
QE1 actually worked rather well in arresting and preventing a deflationary collapse. And there was coordinated fiscal stimulus as well. So we had fiscal and monetary policy pulling in the same direction. Yeah, Dick is quite correct. Um, interest rates hit the lower bound at that point and never have recovered from it. And if you actually look at the path of interest rates over the last 40 years, it was evident they were going to hit the lower bound at some point and never recover from it. And we are now there. And in my view, they're not going to come up again. And we've got to get used to a future where interest rates are probably negative. But um, the mistake we made then was prematurely pulling back on fiscal policy and, in, and requiring monetary policy to do everything, including compensating for the drag on the economy of a premature front-loaded fiscal consolidation concurrently done across multiple economies across the entire Western world. We actually owe China a debt of gratitude on this because China did extraordinary fiscal stimulus and in many ways saved the West's bacon. And it, it's extraordinary that we, we don't ever recognize the role of China in getting us out of the mess we got, in, got ourselves into in 2010. The dangers I see it right now is that firstly, we have not recognized the mistake that we made in 2010. And secondly, that because of that, we seem intent on repeating it. So here we are now coming out of what has been the deepest recession since for 300 years and saying, oh, we need to talk about um, how we raise interest rates, what we do about inflation, what we do about public debt. And for me, no, we don't need to discuss any of that right now. What we need to be doing is saying, how do we restore our economies? How do we do we get them buzzing again? How do we get, as Dirk said, how do we get full employment back? These are the what we need to be putting in place now, to be discussing now. And the other thing we need to be discussing right now is what we can learn, not only from the crisis we've just had, but from the last decade or so, um, so that we can put in place now the kind of policies that we need to make sure that when another crisis hits, and it will, because crises are part of life, um, we don't, aren't scrambling around at the beginning of it to try and get money to people desperately. I mean, we need to be putting in place systems that, that mean we can get money to people in a hurry. Um, I know, um, you know, saying, well, we don't need helicopter money. Well, we don't, might, we don't need it all, at all times, but we will need it again in the future. We've used it in this crisis. We will need it again in the future. We need to be able to deploy it quickly and easily. And we need to put in place the systems to do that now. Um, we, it, these are the kind of debates that we need to be having. And I'm very worried that we're suddenly shifting towards where we were in 2010, trying to frighten everybody about inflation and public debt. And we're missing the opportunity to reconfigure our economies, to make them more resilient, to invest in things that will actually um, help us ward off these kind of crises in the future that will sustain us through crises, um, instead of, um, you know, uh, uh, so that we, we it, when we when the next crisis hits, which it will, and we won't know what it will be, it won't be a financial crisis, it might not be a pandemic, it'll be something else, because that's the nature of crises. But we can say, yeah, okay, it's a different crisis, but we know how to respond to it. We know how to support people. We know how to support businesses. We know how to manage our economies through crises, and we know, how to get them get 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 ourselves back again into what you might call normality, you know, um, a, a, you know a, a, a situation where we have full employment and prosperity when the crisis is over. And for me, that's what we should be focusing on now, not public debt or interest rates or inflation. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, super insightful. And then now, yeah, we would like to um, add Mr. Um, Philip Lambert to the discussion. Um, happy to to have you. Um, you are the co-chair of the European Greens, and um, yeah, have been involved with these sort of economic policy issues for quite some time. And very happy to hear your thoughts on um, yeah fiscal rules, the recovery, and the interaction of fiscal and monetary policy and uh, yeah please here you go well i'm not sure that, uh, of what you uh, really expect from me because this this seems to be a discussion between like-minded people and i can just uh, 
uh, only add to this. So, so, uh, so I will not repeat what has been said. The question is, uh, do we see a window of opportunity to see any change? Indeed, uh, the choice of uh, having monetary policy uh, of, let me put it this way, tying the arm of uh, uh, fiscal policy behind the backs of, uh, of governments uh, was an ideological choice, uh, which is basically neoliberal. There's no question about that. And based on unsound economic science, uh, so it's purely ideology. Uh, now, are the people who have uh, led the, the policies that way, did they disappear? Did they evaporate? No, they are still around. Uh, they still populate uh, most of the uh, alleys of power. Uh, but are they going to continue setting the tone? I, I really don't know. Uh, I would have said uh, before the pandemic, it was likely well, unlikely that I would see any change before the end of my last term, that is 2024. Now with the pandemic, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm not so sure, though uh, I would not uh, irradiate too much optimism. Uh, I know that uh, in the circles of the European Commission, uh, there's, I think, a view at least at the leadership level that uh, going back to the uh, status quo ante, so reinstating the uh, fiscal rules as they were before, uh, is not an option because they realize that uh, fiscal policy is needed both macroeconomically but also because without that uh, there will be no green deal at all. Uh, so they know that with the current uh, kind of rules, we cannot finance, uh, at least do the public part of Green Deal financing. So, um, so there's, I think, uh, a consciousness of that at the uh, Commission leadership level. And of course, there's a consciousness of that in uh, several uh, groups of the European Parliament. But do we see a shared consciousness about that in the European Council? I am not sure. And I would say that I'm a bit, uh, uh, dis well, not distressed but, and, and not surprised, but uh, disappointed by the, uh, by the uh, German election results. And, and, and not so much by the results as by the, the campaign, because it is very clear that neither the Christian Democrats, nor the Liberal Democrats, nor the Social Democrats really want to change uh, the game starting in Germany with their stupid uh, uh, financial rules which lead Germany to be an underinvested country, uh, not just in, uh, in, uh, in high-speed internet, but also the, well, the world-famous German autobahns uh, uh, are suffering big time, but at least the government can present the Schwarzenegger. Uh, so uh, so, so the, uh, the uh, infrastructure of the country is increasingly decrepit, but they take pride in having a Schwarzenegger, which, which, well, I find maybe intellectual or political masturbation, but I'm not sure that this replaces a real thing. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that Germany will help here because the only ones who were actively campaigning to, uh, to change both the German and the European fiscal rules were the Greens. But, well, even if we, we got our best result ever, this is still disappointing. And uh, we will not be able to be part of a two-way coalition. It's going to be a three-way one uh, by design, uh, opposing us on those topics to the other two, whoever those two are. So if Germany uh, does not lift its veto on changing the rules, uh, it's going to be tough because you, you also have the so-called frugals uh, 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 basically, the Ebenezer Scrooges of this world uh, saying uh, uh, that they don't want any change. Uh, so I really don't know. There's motivation in the Commission. Uh, there's a realization that if we reinstate the, the, the fiscal rules as they are, they won't be respected, even less so than before the crisis, because I think that there were 160 some cases of infringement of the fiscal rules. So, I mean, if they infringe so, so many times, surely they are not exactly fit for purpose, but now even less so. I mean, uh, if uh, you see the debt increase, the debt to GDP ratio increase, and uh, this even without having invested for the Green Deal, uh, I guess that, uh, that indeed we are not going to respect the rules as they are anytime soon. 
But again, uh, the public debate is shifting, uh, and I take joy uh, from the fact that even, even in the German, the debate amongst German economists, which is probably the most sclerotic uh, debate uh, in the economics community, there's even signs of life. Uh, that, that people come to realize that maybe they should speak about the world we live in and not about a world that doesn't exist. Uh, so even there, there's move. And I would assume that politicians like Schultz will feel more comfortable if they feel that, well, uh, it becomes not forbidden to speak about things uh, uh, that uh, up until then uh, uh, were really uh, prohibited. So, so I don't know. I would say that in the general uh, uh, political debate, uh, those who advocate status quo now have to defend why we should go back to status quo. So they are on the defensive, but it's not because you're on the defensive that you have lost the battle. I would say that the, the winning spirit is changing side, uh, but but the battle is not won yet. So I would say spirits is a factor of victory, uh, but it takes numbers also and, and sheer strength. And there, I would say that the neoliberals are still uh, a numerical majority in the corridors of power. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Lamatz. That was a very interesting. And yeah, I mean, for me, speaking as a as a German citizen who who voted here, um, I I try to uh, celebrate the small things, like you mentioned, that the the discourse has actually shifted substantially in Germany. But unfortunately, still, yeah, the the, the fetish around the the black zero remains, and that is a, a huge issue. Um, it looks like Alessandra uh, Barazzelli is actually also still with us, um, who gave the input right at the beginning. And so I was wondering, Alessandra, if you wanted to jump in again, and um, I would like to hear your thoughts on this sort of who can we find a, a, in a coalition of the willing, um, like <laughs> if I can phrase it this way. But uh, yeah, Mr. Lamat is just saying, okay, there are some uh, that, that have, uh, were, were the where the ideas have changed and others where it's not maybe just from your perspective as a central banker and um, what what have you experienced this this change that um, all the other discussions have, have mentioned so from from the austerity paradigm and uh, and ecb under triche to where we are now and to possibly how fiscal policy is being discussed within um, central banks Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm here and I'll have to leave in about, you know, a few minutes, but I, it, it was such an interesting discussion. And I, um, you know, I'd like to start with, we started with Francis before we, we went live, um, because I really think that we are witnessing such a, sh a change of scenery, um, whereby, um, you know, we're going to face ourselves with, a number of newcomers to the uh, to the financial market that are going to be so extreme in the way in which they're going to change completely the outlook of this market, and that will have impact on the you know on the uh, on the policies that will have to be put in place in order to uh, maintain and to and to foster you know stability. I'm talking about we were just mentioning what China is doing right now in order to block completely the trade of all the uh, um, you know, the stable coins and the other, um, you know, crypto assets that are tradable right now on the market. I think that this is going to be very much the, the point where we're going to find ourselves uh, with a need for a lot more creativity uh, in order to sustain the financial market, um, you know, and also the timing with which the other, like Europe, is going to come to market, for instance, with the digital euro. I think these issues are very, very important. And I think that we should uh, take that on board in order to really look at uh, the future with some, um, you know, creativity in mind where we are putting down, you know, um, uh, policies. I also do agree very much, Francis, today, it's, you know, our, you know, we, we really share a lot of thoughts the same way. I, I the other thing is that I, I do agree, this is not the time where we need to take money back. I think it's the time where we need really to invest and to, and to create that um, room for liquidity that's going to help uh, uh, recovery. 
um, the, our prime minister the other day, uh, Mr. Mario Draghi said something, you know, very similar to what we're saying here. And he said, you know, this is time where we have to give money. This is not the time where we need to talk about the debt. We will have to though. There will be a time where we need to get there. Uh, but I do agree that right now we are in a very challenging time, but extremely interesting and creative. So I, I, I do have hopes and uh, and I am, I'm an optimistic by nature. I have to admit here, but I I also, as a central banker, I see what we're doing and I'm, I think we're, we're on the right path. Thank you so much for having me uh, today. And uh, I will leave in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Maybe then um, I'll, I'll shift back over to Joanna Maria and um, ask you also on this. I have mentioned this just very briefly in the in my intro that um, Christine Lagarde was recently, um, yeah, mentioning in a speech of hers how monetary and fiscal policy have sort of been working hand in hand. And um, is this something where you where you think this will carry on? This is something that we can sort of rely on in the next. Uh, a couple of years, or do you see the um, a problem in the future where where inflation is actually ri rising and um, the ECB will sort of turn into a more uh, hawkish stance, and and we um, this this coordination or this working hand in hand will actually be uh, an issue or a problem? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get uh, the first part. Is it is it the problem of inflation that you are asking me? I'm wondering if you think that uh, because some people, like in Germany, if you're looking at the election results right now or the discussions they had yesterday, uh, they they were they're already talking about how the ECB can can exit from from this uh, expansive stance that they have right now. And um, at the same time, you ha you hear Christine Lagarde in, in these speeches where she's talking about how uh, monetary fiscal policy can and should work hand in hand. Um, and I'm wondering if you think. This will actually be a, a feasible opportunity in mm -hmm. the next um, couple of uh, mm -hmm. yeah couple of years. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, as you said, in uh, in every country we have conflicting interests, and it depends on uh, how the national and international environment changes. So I think that since Germany is the leading country. Uh, it is actually affecting the policy of uh, not only its own country, but of the EU. So uh, Germany has to uh, tackle two problems, I think. One is uh, its uh, industrial uh, power. And uh, on this field, it has uh, to invest. It has to uh, fill, the, fill the gap that it is uh, accumulating towards China, towards the United States, the environment is changing. So this might uh, go in the direction of uh, uh, easing the uh, policy of uh, uh, public investment, uh, green, not only green, but technology, know-how and all that, uh, and uh, uh, an accommodating monetary policy. On the other hand, I don't think that the neoliberal interest in uh, Germany have been totally uh, defeated. I mean, uh, quantitative easing have distributive effect. It is uh, also increasing the inequality in the distribution of wealth. Uh, it has been uh, uh, feeding the housing and the stock market uh, uh, increases. And this is going to affect and increase the inequality in the economy. So uh, there might be also inflation is another another monger that is uh, used as the, to to say that the European Central Bank should uh, exit from the accommodating policy and uh, sooner or later, slowly, as uh, it might be, but. Uh, increase uh, the rate of interest. So uh, this, the, the path of uh, these changes uh, uh, will affect the, the financial market because the economies are, the financial part of the economy are still very fragile. We have uh, companies that have not yet come out of the uh, disruptions of the pandemic and we have the 
public debt. So exit from cheap money policy could be a very risky step. And uh, so I think that inflation can be used as a as a an excuse for uh, those part of the uh, of the capitalist class that are uh, trying to uh, go back to the old uh, days. What I can see in terms of uh, positive, I have I have heard a lot of positive attitudes, but I think that I mean. The change, the, the international context is changing. And uh, there might be a part of the German industrial uh, class that might think that they need uh, a more cohesive uh, uh, European Union. And this might uh, need a reform of the rules in order to make also the debtor countries to come out of their uh, debt and uh, participate uh, in a common recovery. So this is, I mean, it's not easy to, to, to find out which one will uh, uh, win, but uh, I, I hope that the experience of the last decade when uh, the austerity made so many uh, killings and uh, uh, the change in uh, some change in the economic theory and uh, and uh, the sheer interest self interest will go for a change of policy for a, an enduring change of the policy the mix of monetary and uh, fiscal policy with, thank you so fiscal, much sorry, sorry. With fiscal with fiscal policy intended as uh, public investment in physical and social infrastructure. So let me say why I'm against uh, uh, helicopter money, because I think that uh, the helicopter money is uh, working when the fiscal policy is not working. If they work together, then we can have a, a monetary accommodation of investment, of expenditure. So that's the, the reason why I said I'm not in favor of helicopter money. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe to keep the, the discussion moving forward, um, two thoughts for you, Dirk. First of all, I mean, Germany has been mentioned multiple times, so maybe it would be interesting for the audience to hear as you <laughs> you have like the first-hand experience of working on with this, um, yeah, sort of how government debt is different than private debt in Germany for more than 10 years. Maybe you can share your thoughts briefly just for everyone, sort of what you've experienced and maybe if something has changed in the last 10 years. And then to, to pick up uh, what Anna Maria said, um, what are options to sort of guide fiscal policy towards um, towards public investment to act in, in infrastructure? Is there something, I mean, something that's been discussed today in, in the German news again was sort of these special purpose vehicles that you have outside of the, um, the government balance sheet, something else that has been discussed in, in um, these uh, arenas is to to have monetary financing straight out and, and have the ECB buy bonds of the European Investment uh, Bank that then funds railroads, for example. So just some thoughts to sort of keep the discussion moving, but also if you, if you like to, uh, the, the opportunity to comment on sort of the, the German case. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I think that in Germany, things really have shifted because of the logic of the last crisis. So the pandemic was was really an exogenous shock as, as if there ever was one. Um, so no need for a scapegoat politically. So last time there was uh, a crisis that came out of real estate bubbles and lax financial regulation and the conservative liberal government in Germany needed a scapegoat, which we had from 2009 to 2013. So, so Greek the Greeks had to suffer um, to become, they became the scapegoat. Now, of course, nobody's punished. So when the, the pandemic emergency purchase program was instituted, it was also good for Greek government bonds and all the governments in the Eurozone can nowadays spend however much they want to. Okay, there's no deficit limit. There's no limit of, of the ECB buying bonds. 
I mean, technically there is, but practically there isn't. Um, so, so that's what we have. And I mean, Weidmann is not up in arms and says, oh, this cannot be happening. Okay, so they are silent about it. Why? Because they, they cannot admit that what they always said is the devil's work now is the only solution to, to the situation that we're in. Okay, the ECB has to act as a backstop. It, it has to guarantee liquidity and solvency. So the debate has changed. The order liberals are very silent in this crisis, and, and they better be because their solutions wouldn't work. Uh, and they, they cannot admit that what's happening now is, is the MMT dream, more or less, of, of being liberalized from these rules, these fiscal rules. Okay, so yeah, looking, looking forward, I mean, Francis wrote this book also about the Green New Deal and, and all these things. So, so yeah, we need some kind of, of idea of how much spending we want to have and for what. And that's a democratic thing. Okay, so as an economist, I would never say you now need this, this and that. I'm, I'm an economist. I just say that the money will be there. Okay, it's just a political question of how do we get the money? Do we go first to some kind of United States of Europe and then we have a Euro treasury and they can spend? So Brussels becomes a democratic government instead of a commission. Um, yes, we could do that if there's a political will to do this. Um, or we say, well, let's keep it as it is so that the national governments are free to spend. I mean, since, since the voters don't like inflation anyway, there's not a lot of incentives for national governments to overspend. And I mean, they are free to overspend for one and a half years now. So, so I don't think that they do. Okay. As a matter of fact, it's, it's probably the opposite. They still spend not enough. Then, of course, if you if you want to have some kind of medium solution, you could also think about the Green New Deal, where you say I, I use green bonds from the European Investment Bank, and then they are sold to investors. But the ECB is is the dealer of last resort in these kind of bonds. So, well, we have a variety of solutions which are possible. We can go full fiscal federalism in a way that we we unite as United States of Europe if we want to do that, or we can give the power back to the national governments so that they can spend whatever they want, or we use something in between like the, the European Investment Bank. And I think that we, we should have this kind of discussion about, about what we want to do. So the, the Eurozone, everybody knows this, it's not complete, okay? It, it's not shameful. I mean, it's, it, it happens. I mean, the US, it took, for the US, it took more than 100 years to get a monetary system working, okay? For us, it, it's just 20 years, okay? So, so we know that we had unemployment rates which are too high. So yeah, I think that's the debate we should have. And I see that there's a lot of openings now to have this debate and, and Germany has, has changed quite a lot. So I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic that if we get a new government, if, if the grand coalition will, will continue, then of course it's not gonna work probably. Uh, but if we get a new government, um, then probably I see some space to, for, for new ideas. So I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, then now let's let's hear Francis again. We've, we've heard this term helicopter money mentioned a, a bunch of times. Can you maybe go into detail as the expert here and describe sort of what is meant? Um, I, I think in, in the US, for example, we had these um, government stimulus checks. Maybe that's something you can also mention uh, as an example. I don't know. Well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anna Maria, but I think by helicopter money, you mean actual, actually the central bank creating money and spending it into the economy. Um, but as actually having looked at the distribution channels and the idea, the sort of the Friedman idea that you had a helicopter that dropped money on, on into the streets and everybody came and picked it up actually is wholly unrealistic. That's not how we do helicopter drops. We wouldn't even have dropped, done helicopter drops in that way in his time. Um, and now when everything's so electronic, you just wouldn't do a distribution that way anyway but the problem for central banks is even if they wanted to do something like that they actually can't do it um, they have to use the fiscal rails so in america they've done these big fiscal drops and um, that's been done by the fiscal authority and it's been nominally nominally funded by borrowing but actually the feds mopped a whole lot up so in a way, a helicopter drop, a drop that's done using fiscal rails, so kind of it's the fiscal authority that flies the helicopter, <laughs> um, is fiscal policy anyway, but, it's, but the central bank is backstopping it. And that's essentially, for me, what I wrote about in my book was really about central banks um, using fiscal rails, but the, essentially saying that anything to do with money in the economy, anything that is about getting money to people is the remit of the central bank. It's about money. 
it's the central bank's job. And then you can have an argument about who's distributing it and to whom, because one of the problems with um, central bank tools as they are now is that we haven't taken enough account of their distributional consequences. And I think there's a better way of doing things. And I think over the last 18 months, we've actually demonstrated, it kind of proved the concept of saying we can use fiscal rails to deliver money directly to the real economy, to households and businesses. And we can have a central bank that supports fiscal authorities so they can do that kind of thing without fear of market strikes on, on government debt and things like that. To me, that, that's that been like a, a perfect proof, proof of concept. And the only question is now, where does that mixture of monetary and fiscal policy fit in our paradigm going forward? Is it just, I mean, this is a question that, that, that um, Moritz asked very early, or Anna Maria actually asked very early on, is, is this a new paradigm? Um, is this a complete shift in the way we do fiscal and money, monetary policy? Or is there a, a normal that we can get back to? And the reason I wanted to rubber band back to the financial crisis is as far as I can see, the normal now already is negative interest rates and coordination of fiscal and monetary policy, and it has been for well over a decade. The pandemic merely forced us to um, actually acknowledge that we had to, that fiscal and monetary policy had to coordinate, that this artificial separation we've had between monetary and, pol and fiscal policy is not real and is actually extremely unhelpful. And that poses a problem for the Eurozone, which in a way is constructed on the basis of that separation of monetary and fiscal policy. It's got to find a way of bringing it back together. Uh, now that may be that you'll come up with some creative solution that leaves um, fiscal, uh, the individual states free, um, responsible for their fiscal expenditure, but the ECB has some ability to provide money in some way, whether directly to households and businesses or indirectly to, to um, member states, as it has been doing, do, doing during the pandemic. I imagine there'll be a few lawsuits around that because that seems to be the way Germany does things. Um, but I think, I hate to say it, you'll, you'll end up muddling through. My only prayer really is you do it without inflicting another load of unnecessary pain on the southern periphery. Powerful words. Um, thank you, Francis. Um, uh, Philip Lammertz, uh, you, you have already coined sort of the, the line of the event earlier, and I'd like to ask you to elaborate on this a little bit. You were saying, uh, I think it was, that the Schwarze Null or the yeah the, the government the black zero not spending more than you take in is sort of a political promise, but that's actually more like a, yeah political masturbation and something that you can't really. Um, it sounded to me something that possibly conservatives are promising, even though they know it's wrong and then they know that they're intentionally sort of playing um, playing with this paradigm. Um, is this something that you would like to elaborate on a little bit? Do you? What I mean is that if you are elected as a political decision maker, I find it completely odd that what you want to deliver to the people are not services, but a number. I mean, we are not elected as policymakers to deliver numbers. I'm not saying that numbers don't count. I'm saying that what citizens wait from us, uh, wait for from, from their policymakers are policies are public services are outcomes for society and indeed some of them require no money i mean deciding that the diesel engine must be out by 2030 doesn't cost the the taxpayer money it costs the investors money but that's that's a different thing uh, but other stuff does cost money uh, social security hospitals education and all the rest of it so indeed achieving those results uh, in a financially uh, sustainable and sound way makes sense. But delivering a chassonol and making that the main policy goal, why don't you shut off the state then? No state, no debt, no budget, no nothing. And it's really strange. And, and this I found, uh, you know, I was born 58 years ago, so I, I knew a bit of Germany before it became, well, the, its elites became neoliberal, I found it really remarkable that a country like that, uh, well, say the uh, the homeland of the Soziale Marktwirtschaft, went to be captured by the Chicago school. 
And I found that a, a, a really strange surrender uh, of the, uh, the economics profession, but of course, uh, policymakers and business leaders were not long following that. And again, one of the, the, the scary uh, uh, signs that I see, for instance, is that one of those Chicago boys, uh, Friedrich Merz, uh, has come as, uh, again to the forefront because Laschet was so bad. Uh, now, chances are that CDU, CSU won't end up in the government, but if they do, just imagine the constellation uh, uh, where Greens would face FDP and CDU, uh, the likes of Lindner and Metz. Good luck with that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, no, I, I find it really odd, again, that basically elected policymakers believe that markets do a better job of running society than, than governments. I'm not saying that governments make no mistakes, of course not. Uh, but, but, you know, the blind belief in, uh, in, in, in companies and markets, I find really, uh, how should I say, a sign of intellectual weakness uh, uh, from, uh, from policymakers. And, you know, I've been in a, in a big multinational for 22 years, so I, I've been in the markets. I've seen them function. Uh, or dysfunction. Uh, so, so, so again, there's a lot of good stuff. I don't want uh, markets to disappear, but I want them uh, to, to quote uh, Polanyi, to be uh, embedded in society and not the other way around. You know, and that is the basic question. Uh, I would say that all the liberals want uh, societies to be embedded in markets, and and that is basically the bottom line of the Schwarzenegger and the kind that kind of fiscal rules. We want markets to dictate. Uh, uh, public policy. And frankly, as a Democrat, I don't want this. I really don't. Yeah, that's, <laughs> um, thank you so much for speaking so, so bluntly um, on these issues. That's uh, a very refreshing sort of, um, um, yeah, way to discuss these, these issues. Well, I don't um, think we have a lot of time for, for, for bullshitting around. I mean, uh, no, but all societies, it's not just a climate crisis. I mean, if you look at inequality and, uh, and, and exclusion, I mean, uh, if in France, two thirds of the voters don't even bother going out to vote, that tells you something about the, 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 the level of distrust. And of course, Germany is a, a, a gives a better example. The extremes are a bit shut out and, and the participation is still quite high. But by and large, uh, if you see the the amount of our, the, the number of our citizens that are totally disenfranchised, we are sitting on a uh, on a double time bomb, the environmental one and the social one. So if you still uh, 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 bullshit people uh, uh, about the reality, then then you are wasting precious time. And, and frankly, we have lost too much time because uh, if we had been serious about climate, we would have started after the Club of Rome report 50 years ago. Okay, but so now while we have you and you're speaking so so frankly, I'm going to ask you one one more question and, and then um, go back to the others um, before we close up the round. But what do you think? I mean, when we had this discussion in in Germany in, in during the, the when the pandemic came in and you had um, you, you suddenly had the finance minister minister and the economic uh, minister at the same time going in front of the cameras and saying, "Hey, we're um, now unloading what we're calling a, the fiscal bazooka." And uh, we are going to come here, and we're going to save all the uh, the businesses. And what we're going to do is we sort of um, we'll step in, and you, we'll give you credit, and then we'll guarantee that credit to ninety percent or even hundred percent fully government um, credits. And and then at, at this point, it sort of feels like okay, this this market paradigm, this 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 idea that the markets will always be there to save you, um, was clearly wrong. And um, but I'm always wondering if maybe. For you, from for your perspective as a politician, like how is this something that is still be um, still in in citizens' heads so much, or how is this something that can still be played with um, as a political party, and they can still use these um, uh, these comparisons of of uh, public debt and uh, private household debt and and, and and pretend like it's the same thing and pretend like the markets will yeah, always well, be there. You too. tell me, because I'm not German, and, uh, and well, of course, I, I'm following the debate in Germany, but uh, but it's, it still remains a puzzle for me. And, and, of course, I can imagine that, of course, history plays a role, uh, and we cannot just deny history. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the Weimar Republic uh, 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 massive inflation uh, has traumatized the country, and, and it led to Nazism, and, and 
actually, it's a good thing that that Germany has been traumatized by that. Uh, otherwise, you know, you might uh, well people might want to repeat it. Uh, and of course, all countries are marked by their history. Yet, uh, what what I find odd is that when you have the pandemic, indeed, you have Scholz and Altmaier and others saying, "Okay, well, bazooka." That means that uh, if they see that the vital interests of uh, say the shareholders are really at at the risk, then they will do whatever it takes. But what is strange is that uh, after that, then they revert to well, uh, we have to uh, uh, to turn the the the, the, the screws back. And uh, and when it's for climate, uh, well, you know, this is not such a a, a life threatening uh, threat. This is really strange because the pandemic, frankly speaking, yeah, okay, it did kill maybe six or seven million people on the planet, which is, of course, a lot. But frankly, climate can kill many more. Uh, and so, well, for that, it seems to be difficult to say, well, we need a big bazooka. And and, and this is something, you know, I had a debate, uh, uh, I think it was six months ago now, in the plenary with Markus Ferber. So CSU, uh, one of those... Uh, 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 narrow-minded order liberals. Uh, the guy was saying in plenary, well, you know, it's all nice and well to save the climate, but not at the cost of ruining our economy. And I said, hang on one second. I mean, if climate change succeeds, then there will be no economy. Because, well, human beings w won't be able to live on this planet. So you worry more about, well, we may be dead, but at least we will have zero debt. Fine. But I think that the purpose of human beings is to live, right? and not to leave zero debt to not even to their heirs, because there will be no heirs to speak of. So that tells you how narrow-minded people can be. Or they deny, actually, but they don't want to say so because it's not fashionable, they deny the reality of climate change and the reality of the threat. And they think that actually this is a bit overdone by the Greens and, and, and the Fridays for Future and all the rest of it, but actually we can manage. And, uh, and But again, how, how the German debate has been captured remains an enigma to me. Because, well, of course, I understand the historical trauma, yet uh, you have to look, I mean, as an economist, you have to look at reality. And that really what, what escapes me, and especially in the economics profession, how is it possible that a discipline like uh, the economy has been captured by people who are, uh, instead of, of being scientific, they are ideologues, and basically they design a model and policy, uh, not policies, uh, uh, a vision of society, a description of society, which is a society that does not exist. And when we point at the discrepancies between their models and reality, their answer is reality is wrong. That, that is really strange. And they claim to be scientists. I mean, uh, denying reality, I mean, basically dictating to reality what reality should be. And that these economists still uh, populate uh, uh, most economics shares, business schools, uh, central bank positions, and all the rest of it, this really escapes me. The only time uh, I got the possibility to address uh, the, uh, the ECB in Frankfurt, I mentioned the, uh, the uh, Club of Rome report in 1972. And basically, the only answer I had was, well, you know, they said, uh, uh, they said that, but here we are uh, 45 years later and we're still there. Yeah, but we are exactly where they were, where they said that we would be, that is touching the boundary, the planetary boundaries. Uh, and basically they denied that there was a problem, really like the guy falling from a skyscraper and uh, when it reaches 10th floor, he says, so far, so good, you know, and a split second later, it won't be as good. And that was one thing. And, uh, but what I told them is that what they need is diversity diversity in their recruitment, diversity in economics worldviews. And I don't see a lot of that, frankly. I, I really don't. Uh, and, and this is where I'm most worried. Conversely, I might tell you that if I look at uh, the European Commission and the civil servants there, you can really see a generation gap uh, uh, in the sense that, well, you know, young people joining the Commission, they have kids, uh, they look at reality out there, and even if they are trained economists, they, they, they see that reality and what they were uh, told at, uh, at, at school uh, doesn't correspond. And this is where I see a window of opportunity to change policies. The problem is that those young people are not at the decision levers. They, 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 they are 
they are basically uh, uh, low, low, low rank officials. Uh, for decision makers, it's a bit different, but I can tell you that even in the, in the circle surrounding uh, von der Leyen, you have people there who, who have really grasped the gravity of the situation and want to change it. But then again, they need support. You know, the Fit for 55 package was, was adopted by the college, but it was not, uh, it was not an easy thing. And many, many in the college hate what von der Leyen is doing. Eh? And they wait for the first opportunity to, to shoot her in the back. I can tell you that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump in and we have like a couple of questions up the chat in, in the chat that I want to get to in next five minutes. And then we'll have five minutes for one minute closing statements by, by each and all of you. Um, and uh, maybe Francis, do you want to answer one? There was uh, one by Caroline uh, who asked if, uh, yeah, the U.S. is sort of in a unique position to issue uh, stimulus checks um, with the dollar being the reserve currency, and if that is something that in Europe, I mean, maybe is this something that is different in Europe? How is does how is this in other uh, countries? Maybe we can do that one, and then I'll have one for for Dirk and maybe Anna as well. Yeah, I don't really accept that argument very much. I mean, I would want to point out. For starters, that the US, that the dollar is not the only reserve currency in the world. The euro is also a reserve currency. So is the yen. So is the British pound. There is a hierarchy of reserve currencies of which the US dollar is the largest by far. But the euro is gaining some ground on it. And, and obviously, you know, this is just a question of international demand. I mean, these major currencies um, are not in serious danger um, of, of being dumped because the, um, because, because the, the government has done, done some fiscal stimulus in a, in a pandemic. Um, it, the evidence is that, in fact, um, all of the central banks um, associated with the, that issued those cur currencies without exception, backstopped their governments so that they could do exceptional fiscal stimulus. Some of the, um, the US did these huge um, fiscal drops, other countries did it differently. It still uh, adds up to a huge amount of expenditure. And the financial markets said, yes, that's fine, actually give us more. So um, I, I don't really accept the argument that fiscal stimulus, helicopter drops, or whatever else um, are impossible for um, countries that issue their own currencies and have their own central banks. And central banks are big players in markets. They can support their own countries, um, uh, currents, they can support their own currencies' debt. There is a risk with um, a, a central bank playing in the market that's supporting its own, current, own country's debt that there could be a run on the currency but with the us dollar that is that risk is negligible and i don't think it's a very large risk for other reserve currencies you have to think about where people are going to go and if everybody around the world is doing helicopter drops and fiscal stimulus all the one all at once where are people going to go gold i mean there was a bit of an increase in gold bitcoin there's not that many bitcoin in existence or ever will be. I mean, you know, you have to think about, you know, so with with runs like that, where 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 people are going to go, and um, I don't think it's a serious risk um, in that kind of situation. In fact, I'm not convinced it's a terribly serious risk ever, as long as you have a credible monetary authority and a credible government. It all boils down to confidence in the end. Do these people know what they're doing? Do we? believes that they that they are acting sensibly in the circumstances in which they find themselves to support their economy and dig themselves out of a out of a temporary hole and if yeah and if we think yeah they 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 are credible they do know what they're doing we we are happy uh, um with what they're doing then um investors will invest so i like I said, I think it boils down to that. When you look at kind of cases of hyperinflation, of FX collapse and things like that, you're always dealing with um, governments that have, for one reason or another, lost credibility. Thank you so much, Francis. I would like to ask all of you to, to share your thoughts. Maybe if you can do one minute or, or just a few sentences, but on one positive note. So what do you, um, what have you learned maybe in the last, like, after the pandemic or what did you think wasn't possible or what do you think is might be possible now looking forward is there some something positive on the horizon and um yeah um Anna maria have you were you raising your hand or do you want to try and go first maybe i don't 
on a positive note, well, well, I think that the, the pandemic scared really uh, the government and uh, the international context, uh, which is becoming more difficult for the European Union, actually might uh, help uh, the internal cohesion of the member countries. Uh, I don't know if this is a positive note on the world, uh, because this means that uh, I, I see a world which is becoming more and more regionalized uh, with the rival uh, rivality between uh, different uh, powers, but this can also, if we can manage on the international level with new rules, a coordination of policies, then we can also perhaps hope to have a coordination of policies within the European Union. And uh, these uh, new challenges, the green economy, the new technology race can be challenges, but can also be possibilities, uh, op options, opportunities to go towards a new investment wave, which can create opportunities, good jobs, and perhaps full employment. So I think that this can be an option. We should work for that. And uh, this can be a, a way out of uh, the pandemic and the problems that we are in now. Thank you, Maria. Dick, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you. Um, well, my optimistic note would be that we have talked a lot about deficits of society lately, and we have not talked a lot about fiscal deficits, and I think we should just keep it that way. So, as I said, in, in some kind of sense, we are already living in a new world um, where we have to decide what to do with the resources that we have. We don't want to have some unemployed, so let's do something. We have lots to do. There's lots of inequality. There's climate change. There's all these problems with sustainability. So there are many, many deficits in our societies. And, and as I said, I mean, this kind of, of mode that we had in the Eurozone for, for one and a half years, I think it worked pretty well. And now we have to get used to it. And I think to some extent, we cannot, we cannot go back to the old rules. The ECB cannot, cannot sell all the government bonds it has bought. Um, also, we will see some nice effects. So we have zero interest rates. Uh, and that means that that in the end, a couple of years down, uh, interest payments by governments will be zero anyway. Okay, so all of this will go away. Um, the ECB is, is buying up government bonds too. So they own, I don't know, more than 20% of them anyway now. So imagine they go to 100, then we get rid of public debt completely. Um, so, so, I mean, the way this thing is moving more or less, it, it kind of tells you that the economy is, is behaving in a much different way than we thought it would. So I think that people will recognize, just as my students do, that, that these things are the new normal and that we cannot return. And, and that's that's also but a political thing, but I think the young people understand that more more quickly. Um, but they will have all the power in the future. So, yeah, I dedicate this to them then. <laughs> Thank you, friends. Do you want to go next, and then we'll have Philip at the end. I I share some of Dick's optimism. Um, I don't think we're going to be returning to positive interest rates um, while the demographic. Um, trend is as it is and actually in terms of where we're heading in terms of the planet I mean, we've talked a lot about the, the green challenge the climate change and the rest of it but there's also the demographic challenge um, and actually as a species we do need to end our tendency to to grow without limit um, and that will happen it is happening we're already past peak child but the effect of that is that is to depress interest rates they're going to be negative really forever and we need to get used to that it's it is a paradigm change I, I all these people talking about interest rates i'm going yeah they'll raise interest rates and then they'll cut them again like they did last time um and on the public debt thing dig um i don't think it will go to zero because public debt actually does have a use <laughs> it is a savings vehicle and that's what it should be not a speculative vehicle i would like to see public government people recognizing that that what they do when they buy public debt is they they are buying a share in their country's future um and that public debt should be primarily owned by the country's own citizens not by financial markets 
right? That's another personal view. And on the final view, and this actually picks up something that was in the comments, um, another hope, and it's picking up also something that that, that um, Alessandra said earlier about the, the changes in the financial system, which the way I see it are very much moving away from a debt-based um, monetary paradigm towards one that's based upon something more akin to equity, more akin to, akin to sharing and building up wealth. Now, we are going to have liquidity problems because of that. It's a hugely liquid paradigm at the moment. But eventually, I think we will recognise that the role of central banks is to it really, and governments, is to provide liquidity into that paradigm so that people can build up wealth rather than building up debt. And I, and I, I, think, I think I would regard that as a hugely important step forward. Thank you. Okay, and then last not but at least, uh, Philip. Yeah, well, uh, I will just repeat uh, that uh, the the ground is shifting. Uh, that uh, the defenders of the uh, neoliberal order are on the defensive, and that's a good thing. Uh, let's fight it out then. Okay. Well, thank you all very much, um, especially to yeah all the panelists and keynote speakers and everyone at New Economics Foundation's Positive Money and uh yeah for making this this event happen and i just wanted to let you know that uh, there are still more events throughout the week so fiscalmatters.eu you can see all the different events and for me this was definitely a very insightful um yeah discussion i'm i, I think we had a lot of agreement sort of on why um yeah there's a need for more fiscal policy now why there's um sort of a, a bigger paradigm shift between what um Friedman has said and what kind of grew out there in, in neoliberalism and now um, where we are now and also what kind of um, world we live in and how many more crises we might face and um, how we'll have to just sort of learn to deal with this uh, new normal but what is still remains unclear is sort of what, what kind of rules and what kind of mechanisms we'll, we'll find to, to adjust. But uh, yeah, for me personally, um, I also think that there is some, some reason for optimism. I did not think that uh, Ms. Lagarde or anyone from ECB would make a statement like she did three weeks ago about monetary policy and fiscal policy working together, which at least seems to, yeah, you, seems to under, or show that the ECB does understand sort of the dynamics of the situation. And I mentioned this briefly before that uh, when I was still a student in my master's in 2014, we had uh, Dirk Inns there for a lecture on modern monetary uh, theory. And I remember back then it was sort of super far on the, in the, in the left uh, progress side and no one wants to talk about this. It was sort of a very niche topic. And now you can tell that um, the discussion has changed significantly ever since the pandemic and sort of in favor of um, the role of, of fiscal policy. And so I'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much and um, hope you have a good rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.